<clears throat> okay, now let us begin Hebrews chapter 11. There are still some leftover gleanings here that we can learn and enjoy from the book of Hebrews. We finished off uh, verse 21. Now we're going to go through verse 21. Again, fresh review. This chapter is on the heroes of faith. The book of Hebrews is addressed to the tribulation timeline. So Hebrews, Jews, that's already a giveaway. Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 2 told you about end times, last days, that it's written for that. So this is written to he, uh, tribulation Jews. However, remember, this is around the same time where Paul is receiving his revelation concerning about the body of Christ, which is the Christian church. Yeah. So because of that, there is a spiritual body of Christ that is simultaneously operating during that time when Paul is writing tribulation doctrine to Jews. What that means is then there is double application here. So you will see Christian doctrine here related to the body of Christ because it was already operating that time Amen. in spite of what mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists say. That's right. And then a second thing to keep in mind is that this is not a Christian writing. A lot of people think this is completely a Christian writing. That's not true. It is written for Jews in the tribulation. So the, there's a double application here. Christian doctrine, tribulation doctrine, okay? Hebrews chapter 11, what we see here is that however you want to apply the verse, it can apply to both parties very easily. So that's what you're going to notice. There's nothing here in Hebrews 11 pretty much that contradicts our Christian doctrine. So a Christian can apply himself to Hebrews 11 pretty easily. The only exception is obviously when it describes the faith of the Old Testament saints, like I told you before, even though the writer of Hebrews is talking about faith of these Old Testament saints that we can learn from, during the Old Testament time, that was more than just their everyday living by faith, like us Christians. When we look at faith here, we're seeing how we can apply everyday life, how we can practically apply it, how we can apply it to our Christian walk. But to these Old Testament saints, it's just more than their everyday life. It's their very own salvation. So I've demonstrated from these cases in Hebrews 11 that you plainly see works coming out from their faith. So Old Testament salvation, which is faith and works, which tribulation saints can easily learn and apply. As for our case, we don't apply it as salvation. We apply it as our practical living. So what works are we doing from our faith in our practical living? Let's see, and let's continue it. So remember, it's a universal application, Hebrews 11. You can freely apply it to yourself because we're seeing from a practical living standpoint, not salvation. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 21, By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph. This passage, now remember, I'm going to explain each and every word from the verse. So look at that verse, make sure my explanation matches it, because I could be lying to you. That's one of my favorite phrases, right? That should be one of my quotes, Gene Kemp's quotes. I could be lying to you, you know? So make sure you pay attention to every word in the verse and see if it lines up. Uh, meaning that because Jacob has faith, during his time of death, as he was dying, he had the faith to bless the sons of Joseph. So he believed that the blessing would come to pass. <clears throat> At the same time, the Bible says, and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. So you can see from this drawing right here that <clears throat> Jacob, he is leaning on the top of his staff. So it's pretty much self-explanatory. And he is blessing both the sons of Joseph. He had faith in doing that. Now there's a problem right here if you're going to compare that with Genesis 47. Genesis chapter 47. There's a problem right here because Jacob, when he was blessing the two sons of Joseph, his carnality interfered. Even though we see right here Jacob is a man of faith, he has so much faith in God, 
there is a contradiction of carnality interfering. So carnality is the hindrance to faith. But in spite of this hindrance to faith, the Bible says that he was still a hero of faith, which is hard to believe. So then how are we going to uh, reconcile this problem here? Because it seems to be somewhat contradictory. How can God bless it? How can God honor it? Well, if you look at the whole story, you can see what the Holy Spirit did. He ignored the carnal parts and concentrated on the right parts that he did in his uh, blessing, in his act of faith. So in Genesis chapter 47, uh, <coughs> uh, notice right here at verse, uh, uh, let's see, uh, actually uh, I got the wrong one. So it's uh, Genesis 48, excuse me, Genesis 48, <coughs> Genesis 48. Notice in verse 9, uh, And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Okay, nothing wrong here. But look what uh, Jacob or Israel did. If you look at uh, verse 13, And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand toward Israel's right hand, and brought them near unto him. And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. Okay, meaning that the primary blessing should go to the firstborn. Now, Jacob knew that. It said wittingly. But he didn't care about that. He gave the primary blessing to the younger, which obviously you know why. His carnal nature. Jacob was the younger son, and then Esau was the older son, but he got the primary blessing. So because of that carnality, he wanted to do the same thing. So you might wonder, how can God bless that? And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, the angel uh, which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and uh, let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. Verse 17, And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. Now, notice right here, this is the blessing, verse 15 and 16. But that blessing was not a primary blessing on, Ephraim, uh, on the eldest son, the older son, Manasseh. He blessed both the boys. So it, in this blessing, which was right, not carnal, that was an act of faith where Jacob believed it would happen, the blessing would occur, and God honored it. But verse 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, do you see that there? That's the primary blessing given to the younger son and then the secondary blessing to the older son. See that? The Holy Spirit, he ignored that part. And then he concentrated on verse 15 and 16, which is pretty clever. Now, like I told you before, <clears throat> if... If, like in the last case with Isaac, in spite of the weakness, God can somehow overlook it and see their act of faith, you might be surprised then it would be the same thing with carnality. So let's even assume that there was something carnal in there. How would God overlook that and bless his act of faith? Go to 1 Chronicles 4, 1 Chronicles 4. It's called the mercy of God. It's called the grace of God. Go to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. Verse 10. Now, this is not an ideal prayer to pray. The only ones who would pray this are prosperity gospel charismatics who love this prayer, and you'll hear this quite often, okay? It's a very carnal prayer, believe it or not. The carnal prayer is as follows in uh, 1 Chronicles 4, verse 10. 
And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that thou wouldest bless me indeed and enlarge my coast, and that thine hand might be with me, and that thou wouldest keep me from evil, that it may not grieve me. And God granted that which he requested. Would you believe that? That's really funny. You'll notice at verse 9, the Holy Spirit wrote, And Jabez was more honorable than his brethren. How about that? So notice right here that, that his act of faith, it's, and in spite of a carnal prayer, the Lord nevertheless blessed it. Now, you got to balance that out, however, with go to James chapter 4. Go to James chapter 4. The Bible talks about that God does not answer prayer when there's lust involved, when there is carnality involved. So go to James chapter 4. When there is a connection of carnality in your uh, prayer life, then the Lord, he does not honor or bless that uh, because God doesn't want to please your lust. So then uh, there seems to be a contradiction here uh, with Jabez prayer versus James chapter 4. So go to James chapter 4, and then we'll see the supposed contradiction here. Now notice what James warned in the Word of God. He mentioned in verse 2, verse 2, ye lust and have not. Mm -hmm. And then he says right here in verse 3, ye ask, so that's prayer, and receive not, because ye ask amiss that ye may what? Consume, Consume it upon your lust. So this is gratifying lust. But uh, how is this balanced? How this is balanced is this. Weren't there times that you did pray and God shouldn't answer with a yes, but he answered yes anyway? Yeah, mm -hmm. That's right. yeah. yeah he did. Why? Because he's a gracious father. Right. So uh, when you ask things that is not for your good or for your betterment, the father or the good parent will quite often say no, no, no. But if that per kid just really persists, and the parent really loves a child, sometimes the parent gives in, correct? So that's just God's grace and mercy. Now, there are times uh, when, here's another thing. Another thing is, there are certain requests we pray for that uh, it may be carnal or it may not be carnal, but the simple answer is, you ever seen God answering prayers of your desires before? Yeah. Not just actual needs, but desires? He does. Yeah, the Lord does that at times. He does that sometimes, which shows a graciousness and a loving father. So then in those times that you pray, and this did happen before, happened before where uh, we would have desires in me and Min Jung's prayer life, and there were certain desires we wanted, uh, not just actual needs, but wanted, but then God, he answered the prayer miraculously. So one of them was actually a church building. So then uh, she said, well, I'm going to pray for a church building and then we'll get it this year. And then I'm like, well, I was laughing. I was like, well, you can pray for it, honey. But I prayed for years, you know, me and Max worked so hard, you know, me and my co-pastor were researching everywhere and then we're trying to find a church for him to pastor, you know. <laughs> so me, so onliners, no, no, I do not have a co-pastor. But anyway, <laughs> just clarify that it was a joke. But anyway, so we were uh, looking everywhere and we were praying and the whole church was praying. And then for some weird reason, the Lord answered my wife's prayer. So whenever we, we want something or need something or anything, I'll tell my wife to pray for me. You know, that's the lesson I learned. Yeah. But that shows God's uh, very, under, uh, he's very understanding, gracious and merciful. And actually, he even answered a prayer where we got our own, own new place, too. So a new place on top of a new church building the same year. Yeah. Now, if I ain't God, I don't know what that is, okay? So that is truly God. And you know it did happen with you, too. Because God does not really have to answer your prayers with the yes, and you know that. That's right, preacher. You know, I would even dare say most of the requests we have here may not be needs. Come on. Thought about that? Could be more so of our desires, and then we've seen how God answer it, right? So notice that these acts of faith that we have, in spite of when the Lord hears it, 
<sighs> I know that you believe you have faith in me that I can answer it, but, you know, you could correct that prayer more. You could be a little bit more spiritual in your prayer, right? Let's be honest. When we pray, uh, we don't really pray the right way in everything quite often. So the Lord, in spite of the incorrect ways that we pray sometimes, He still answers. That's a, that's a gracious Father. Now, imagine a faith like that, that you can believe that God can provide and God can give it to you in spite of carnality interfering. That shows a wonderful thing about His grace. Man, that's a wonderful thing. The other answer is this. The other answer, which is possible, is if you look at James chapter 4, notice it says consume upon your lust. So in other words, it keeps gratifying it. So there are times God can give in to your desires. Even sometimes it may be carnal. But if it satisfies your carnal nature, see that? If it gratifies it, then he is not a good father to you. He's spoiling you. Does that make any sense? So sometimes you should be thankful when he doesn't spoil you. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's good. That's good. Uh, it shows what a great father he is that he would give in to our desires, but know how much not to give in to our complete desires. Amen. So that's a great, only God can do that. So that should encourage you in your life of faith. Certain desires you have in your heart, certain things that you've been praying for, why not trust in a good father to provide? That's a huge blessing, isn't it? Uh, here's a better blessing, okay, uh, that I want to emphasize. Uh, this is one of the things that I taught in my lessons of prayer. I don't know if you remember. But when you pray, the faith, when in spite of carnality interfering, should be as follows. We can have faith that God can answer with a yes in spite of our carnality being in it. But we can also still pray in faith when he says no, Amen. when he doesn't gratify our carnal desire. Meaning then you can have faith however way he answers. Amen. So God's answer to prayer is such a wonderful thing that you can take faith in no matter how he answers it. Does that make sense? Basically, however way he answers it, you can have faith that it will be for your best, your betterment whether he says yes to your desire or no, but he'll do it what's best for you. That's a wonderful thing about God. Okay, going back to Hebrews chapter 11 and then verse 22, Hebrews eleven twenty-two. 22. <coughs> By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. Okay, meaning that Joseph had faith when he was dying, just like his father Jacob, he mentioned that the children of Israel would leave the land of Egypt one day. So he was prophesying. So then we see our next case here, Joseph. He believed that one day the Jews would get out of Egypt and gave commandment concerning his bones. So he commanded uh, the Jews and the next generations that they would take his bones out of Egypt uh, when they depart, which shows the negativity of the land of Egypt. So it shows right here that the right belief should not go in line with Egypt. The evidence is given through biblical history as well as world history. When you study Egypt, it is a very, very wicked, evil place. So you, a Christian has nothing to do with Egypt. God has, doesn't want us to have anything to do with Egypt. Go to Jeremiah 41. Notice that God gave strict commands that the Jews are not to go into Egypt. All right, go to Jeremiah 41. Jeremiah 41. Here they are, they want to go to Egypt. But notice uh, what Jeremiah told them. In Jeremiah chapter 41, and then we'll go to verse 17, verse 17. And they departed and dwelt in the habitation of Chimham, which is by Bethlehem, to go to enter into Egypt. What's wrong with that? There shouldn't be anything wrong if God is not against Egypt. I mean, if you and I went to Egypt right now, it's nothing wrong with that one. But why is it with Old Testament Jews that Egypt is so negated that God didn't want them to go? Look at the next one. 
You'll notice that uh, at verse uh, 4, Then Jeremiah the prophet said unto them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray unto the Lord your God according to your words. And I like what he said right here. I will keep nothing back from you. Yeah. All right, so this can be a good preaching. So here are people saying, don't keep back anything from God's word for us. So when you preach, let it loose, preacher. <laughs> look what happened. And then... Uh, Look what they said, verse 6. Man, this is a good sermon. Somebody should preach this sermon. The people said, the congregation said, whether it be good or whether it be evil, we will obey the voice of the Lord. And then look what Jeremiah did, okay? Jeremiah answers in verse 9, And said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, unto whom he sent me to present your supplication before him, if ye will still abide in this land, then I will build you. So in other words, don't go to Egypt. Stay in Israel. And then notice in verse, uh, let's see, uh, da, 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 da. verse 11, Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom ye are afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I am with you to save you. And then uh, verse 13, But if he say, We will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, No, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war, nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. And now therefore hear the word of the Lord, ye remnant of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if ye wholly set your faces to enter into Egypt and go to sojourn there, verse 16, then it shall come to pass that the sword which ye feared shall overtake you there in the land of Egypt. Well, guess what their answer was? If you hear their answer... That verse 1, chapter 43, verse 1, chapter 43, verse 1. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God has sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Johanan the son of Kareah, and all the proud men. See, that? that's the problem with the members, the audience. They have pride. Saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. What happened to, <coughs> Whatever you say, we will yeah. obey the voice of the Lord. Don't hold back anything from us, yeah. Jeremiah. And Jeremiah said, I won't hold back any word from God from you. If you want me to preach, I'll cut it loose. And then they, when they heard the preaching, no, how dare you? I'm offended. I want to walk out. That's our Bible-believing brethren today. That's our Bible-believing brethren today. Anyway, that's a good sermon right there. Point is, uh, in spite of a good sermon, God says, don't go to Egypt. He doesn't like Egypt. Even when Jesus went into Egypt, notice what the verse says in Matthew 2. Go to Matthew 2. Even when Jesus went into Egypt, notice how the Holy Spirit would word it. Matthew chapter 2, verse 14, when Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus fled from King Herod to go into Egypt, notice how the Holy Spirit sees this as. Matthew 2, 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt and was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, out of Egypt. Have I called my son? Meaning that even though they went into Egypt to flee, the Lord didn't want them to stay there long and he wanted them to get out of there. And actually the verse said out of Egypt, not into Egypt, out of Egypt. So notice that the Holy Spirit emphasized more about getting out of there more than getting in. It shows his impression of the land of Egypt. Basically, it's a bad place. Don't go there. So go to Revelation chapter 11. As a matter of fact, the Antichrist, when he sets up his uh, new world order and kingdom, God sees that spiritually as Egypt. That's how bad Egypt has. It has such a horrible reputation. Book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8. Chapter 11 and verse 8. The Bible says, <coughs> And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, will you believe that? Could you believe that? How about that? All right, now go to, back to Hebrews 11. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11. One thing you learn, Egypt is a bad place. It is condemned throughout the scriptures. 
But a lot of people, you're going to hear uh, these people online say so much good stuff about Egypt when there's nothing good about Egypt. They're going to talk about the early churches that were there, the Alexandrian manuscripts, which is where all your modern Bible versions come from. And they're going to say, oh, you know, the, the reason why we use the NIV, the reason why we go by these modern Bible versions, the ESV, is because of the critical text, which is actually Alexandrian manuscripts. Now, Alexandria, we know, is in Egypt, right? So because it's over there, and the scholars claim that it's the oldest. So because it's the oldest manuscript, this is closer to the actual original writings of the apostles. And hence, we can see right here that uh, the Alexandrian manuscripts should be the one we should go by. So that's what they're going to emphasize to you about these Alexandrian manuscripts. But they come from Egypt. So you can't trust it as far as you can kick it with your left foot. Why would you trust this place? By the way, even atheists, like the Harvard scholar uh, Eldon J. Epp, he mentioned even uh, if you were to argue about Egypt uh, with its uh, ancient condition where you can get the oldest manuscripts, where older is better, he argues that to find the original writing is not through some kind of oldest text. Because there was some uh, blah, blah, blah. No, you're not interested. Forget it. Right. No, no, no. No, no, no. You reeled us in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Long story short, my wife is rolling her eyes because yeah. she knows that I'm work. She knows that I worked on this one. All right. Yeah. But long story short, okay. Long story short is that um, I'm not going to get on the genealogy. But to find the simplest way to say it is to find the original reading is through looking through the variances, comparing of all manuscripts. Because you see the distinctions of how they're writing, you can go backwards to find the original more. As a matter of fact, even if you have weak manuscript evidence for, the, for a certain KJV reading, the critical text or the, the modern Bible version's Nestle Allen text, where they primarily go by Alexandrian manuscripts, there are times that they go by a minority reading. So they don't really go by primary, oldest, or really good manuscript evidence. They even go by minority reading. Exactly. So they're inconsistent with their method. And that's actually the right thing to do as a manuscript scholar is to acknowledge even minority readings. Why? Because you're comparing all manuscripts, looking, studying through all variances where you can trace back the actual original writing. And this can even go with no manuscript evidence. You can even just go by church fathers, for example, or even patristic evidence, they called it. In other words, seeing what the church acknowledged as the right reading. Why the early church, ever since from then to that time, was our KJV manuscripts, which is from Texas Receptus, from Byzantine, through Old Byzantine, which can differ from the majority text. Blah, 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 blah. I'm done. Okay. All right. So now... Uh, we're going to go back right here. <laughs> we're going to go back right here uh, in uh, verse 23 now. Verse 23. So bottom line is when they tell you this is something more Christian, don't trust it, okay? Don't trust it. Egypt is a bad place. It has a bad history. And then we'll look at verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hit three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Meaning that uh, Moses uh, had faith, but uh, this is referring more so uh, to the parents. So through Moses' life, there was faith enacted when he was born. So what kind of act did the parents have faith with Moses' life? Uh, they hit him for three months, and the reason why is because he was a proper child, meaning that he was a fair, healthy baby. So they weren't afraid of the king's commandment. Remember Pharaoh, uh, the verses, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So remember Pharaoh, he ordered that all the babies should be killed. And Moses' parents, as, uh, who aren't very exemplary of left-wing liberals, 
did not concede to the government and made sure that even if their lives were at stake or even if their lives were endangered, they would take care of their baby. Did that make any sense? You, you, they always uh, boast about women's rights and all this kind of stuff, you know, protecting lives and stuff like that, which is why they're justifying what? Aborting? Abortion? See that? Why? If they lived in, you know, I guarantee you this, these, these idiotic left-wingers and liberals, if they lived during this time under Pharaoh, oh, they would comply to his order and they would not hesitate to kill their babies. Well, anyway, on, yeah, but Matthew 24, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Speaking of which, I, I believe that uh, with the abortion that's going on, the devil is going to use that sometime for the tribulation. Mm -hmm. So when the author of Hebrews is writing about uh, these parents who had faith where their baby would oh, not be killed, wow. remember he's, uh, yeah. the Hebrews is the audience in the tribulation. I wonder if he's using this as an example, it is possible he could be using this to encourage the tribulation Jews that don't comply with the government's order and protect your babies. And everything can go in that person's mind. Well, if I have a baby, how am I going to survive in the tribulation? How am I going to feed my baby without the mark of the beast? But then God, he wants them to have faith in how he would care on how he would care for them. So Matthew 24 gives that warning about during the tribulation how people will be in great woe and sorrow, that the tribulation saints would be in great woe and sorrow if they were ever to give birth to babies. Because how are they going to feed the babies? How are they going to take care of them? <clears throat> so if you look at Matthew chapter 24, notice right here in verse 19, verse 19, And woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. Boy, wouldn't uh, abortion be a very tempting thing during the days of the Antichrist? And I wonder, Pharaoh is a typology of the Antichrist in the Bible. I wonder if the Antichrist, the Antichrist, who can typify the Pharaoh, might give them that kind of option. I mean, you see it in current events already. I mean, it's just so crazy that when the uh, Supreme Court judges made a ruling concerning about abortion. You saw these uh, idiotic left-wingers, how they went to the, Sat uh, the Church of Satan, offered up, you know, uh, when they wanted to do abortions. So here they are, pretty much like Moloch, sacrificing babies, like Pharaoh, where you kill the babies. They were doing something like that, dedicating their act to Satan. I mean, that's a real thing that's been going on. Uh, last year, was it? Yeah, it was last year or two years ago. That, so that, that was, that's insane. If people did that without hesitation, without a conscience, what happens when the real Antichrist, the real thing, launches it? So I think there's something possible that could happen. All right, let's go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 24, verse 24. I mean, if people just do abortion so easily, even more so if, you're, uh, if the Antichrist were to order it, what if he did a mandatory thing on it? And you'd be afraid of your life and you'll have to do it. So uh, I'm saying it's a possibility. I'm not saying it is going to happen, but it would make a lot of sense. I mean, I can see liberals easily doing that. I mean, if they're easily doing it out of their freedom, well, more so if they're demanded to do it. See, that's scary stuff. Yeah, I'm preaching at our society. I'm really sick of this liberal society that we live in. Okay, anyway, uh, let's look at uh, verse 24. Verse 24. The Bible says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So Moses had faith when he was up in years, getting up in age. He rejected the status of being part of Pharaoh's family. He didn't want to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Remember, Pharaoh's daughter uh, took in Moses and took uh, him <coughs> as her own son. But Moses refused that status. And verse 25, this is good. 
choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Man, that's a great verse to memorize. <laughs> so Moses, he made a choice. I'm going to suffer with uh, God's people, those Jews. I prefer to suffer with them. If I'm going to have to go down as a slave with them, then God's will be done. I'm willing to do that if I have to suffer affliction with them because I don't want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season because he knew that everything that he enjoyed in his lifetime in Egypt, uh, even though it was wrong, it was worldly, it was only a temporary moment. So he believed in that. So he preferred suffering more than enjoying life into the world. So here we are where a lot of Christians nowadays, they obviously, they just want to enjoy things in the world, which uh, God, he does not like. And uh, in our case, the temptation's strong. I, I recognize that. But we got to learn our lesson from these other uh, heroes of faith in the past. You're not the only one and you're not the first one. These heroes of faith went through similar scenarios like we did. And Moses, he had to make a choice. He had to make a choice with, uh, should I choose the world or should I choose uh, suffering? Now, you notice right here that uh, I didn't say a choice between good and evil. I said uh, suffering or pleasure. Now, uh, let's be honest, we're going to choose pleasure, not suffering. Who likes suffering? But a lot of times in life, listen, in your act of faith, what you're going to have to do is it's, you don't really see good and evil. It's hard, even though you believe in that. You know what the Word of God says. But everything in your fleshly sensation, it's not that. Everything in your fleshly sensation is either suffering or pleasure. And that's just the ugly reality of things. So you're going to have to make a choice. Will I suffer or will I have pleasure? And that's the real thing when, you come to, uh, when it comes down to the flesh. How are you going to choose suffering? That's a hard thing to do. How are you going to choose suffering when pleasure is a far more better option. You look at the next part. It says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches and the treasures in Egypt. So in other words, what Jesus Christ uh, went through, the reproach, the criticism, the pains that he went through. So he respected, that's what esteem means, he valued that as greater riches. Wow, that's powerful. So that suffering has a greater richness than the pleasures, the treasures, the worldly possessions in Egypt. Th so this means right here that Moses, he aligned himself, he joined himself with the sufferings of Christ. Now we Christians, when we're going through suffering, we're supposed to align ourselves with the suffering of Jesus Christ as well. Correct? So that's what it means right here about the reproach of Christ that Moses esteemed, meaning that he aligned himself with that. So because he's like many other saints before him and even after him that aligned themselves with the sufferings that Jesus Christ also went through, this is explained more at John chapter 2, John chapter 2. It doesn't mean that Moses had knowledge of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. What it means more so is that this is a term, the reproach of Christ. So this reproach of Christ that God puts throughout every dispensation, any saint who has suffered, God puts that along with that term. That is defined as the reproach or the suffering of Christ. So let's look at John chapter 2. Notice that Jesus Christ went through this suffering that all the saints went through, which is why it was termed the reproach of Christ or the suffering of Christ. Go to John chapter 2. And then uh, notice right here when we look at verse, let's see here, 
verse 17, and his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Now, where he's quoting from right here is we go to Psalm chapter 69. Psalm chapter 69. So he's quoting from a passage that the psalmist wrote about. Jesus Christ identified himself, or the psalmist was prophesying in a way that identified with what Jesus Christ said. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So it basically applied to him. Notice in verse 9, the full verse is, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are what? Fallen upon me. So see, Jesus Christ had the reproach on him. So that was, that's why it's known as the reproach of Christ. Go back to Hebrews 11. Nice. Hebrews chapter 11. Now let's continue on this thought about choosing suffering more than the world. How can anyone do that? How can someone choose suffering over pleasure? How can someone respect that, value that as greater riches? The last part of verse 26 says, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Because he valued, he respected about the recompense. That's the payback that he's going to receive. He's going to receive a reward from God. Verse 27, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. So Moses had faith where he was willing to forsake Egypt, the pleasures of the world. He didn't fear the king's anger or wrath against him. He was up against the entire empire of Egypt. So the verse says, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Meaning that Moses, he endured through that. See, that is aligned with the sufferings of Christ, the reproaches of Christ. So he put up with it because he kept seeing God. That's the one who is invisible. He was seeing uh, the invisible things, the heavenly rewards, the recompense. So he kept looking at those things, the rewards that he would receive. Now, before I continue that thought about choosing suffering above pleasure and the recompense of reward, let me explain the part of verse 27, which some of you probably got confused. It doesn't seem like Moses, uh, that he had faith and he didn't fear the wrath of the king. If you recall, he played chicken. So you recall that he murdered someone and then he ran away from Egypt and wasted 40 years of his life out of fear of Pharaoh. And even when God told him to deliver the people out of Egypt from a burning bush, he was still afraid. And even when he went down into Egypt the first time and preached, he was still afraid. So what in the world is God talking about? Another example of a people who act by faith and just do the best that they can, you'd be surprised how much the Lord can ignore the certain sins and the failures you had as you live by faith. So what God tends to do, so listen, this is very encouraging, and I think I mentioned this before, is that when you live by faith, we're all going to make mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. Live by faith, but mistakes happen. Well, what God likes to do when, even though mistakes happen, is to ignore that part. And you notice that in Moses' case. He likes to ignore the parts where you messed up and focus only on the parts where you were able to do right by faith. So as you live your life by faith, hey, I know that you messed up, but God also remembered those times that you didn't mess up that you did have acts of faith and you did trust in him. I know some of you, you get on yourself for certain things that you skip church again, where you uh, skipped your Bible reading prayer again, where you messed up in your sin again. But I want to encourage you keep living by faith. Well, I, I can't do that. I'm such a mess up. No. Would you like God to ignore your mess up and keep in mind the good things that you did for him? Yeah, that's very encouraging, isn't it? I mean, look at Jacob. You think his is a life of a, he, he's an ideal Christian? 
This guy was one of, one of the worst people who ever lived. And by the way, we're going to look later on at Samson. That guy was a fornicator. So God, what he does, he wants to concentrate on the good things you did for him and want to ignore the bad things, the things that you messed up in. Now, that's a blessing from God. So that's why I try to live by faith. That's the most ideal thing to live by. God wants to uh, focus on this. God wants to focus only on this. He doesn't want to focus on this, okay? He wants this out if he's going to focus on that. So through these people's lives that we've seen, which is such a great encouragement, all saints that we've seen right here, all these heroes of faith, you're going to catch mistakes that they've committed. But God, he doesn't want to focus on those things. He just wants to try to focus on the good that they've done, the act of faith that they were actually able to commit for him. So how does this work? Well, it's the same thing like we did with Jacob. It's the same thing like we did with Isaac. The Lord is able to find a way around it. How was he able to go around doubting Isaac, car carnal Jacob, and fearful Moses? Well, all he had to focus on was, notice the, there are two, two timelines you can easily think of. Notice right here that verse 24 through 26, right? That was when he was being raised in Pharaoh's household. So while he was being raised in Pharaoh's household, God took account of his act of faith and remembered that. Another thing is when you look at verse 27, verse 27, recall that when he went back to Egypt, yes, he was afraid at first, but the remaining time that he spent in Egypt, he wasn't afraid. He was bold. Remember, he said, your firstborn's gonna die. Remember, he told them straight right at Pharaoh's face, at the last plague in Egypt. The beginning, he messed up on that. He was afraid, but the last one, he did it. And God took an act of that and said, now you live by faith. I'm going to remember that. Amen. So that's the blessing. That's the reason why the author of Hebrews can say at verse 27 that Moses, he was able to endure and not fear the wrath of the king. <coughs> now, there are several things that I want us to look at regarding Moses' act of faith, continuing on the topic, he was focusing, he was able to choose suffering rather than pleasure, rather than the world. So let me put pleasure here. That would be a better wording. Does your flesh want to feel pleased or doesn't want to feel hurt? Well, let's be honest. It wants to feel pleased. So how can anyone make a choice like that? That's a duh thing. But Moses was able to make a choice like that because what he had to do, which is what everybody doesn't want to do, but faith requires this, and you're going to have to get both of your ears open on this part, is that an act of faith has endurance. Faith has endurance. Why should I endure? Then that means you don't have faith in what God's going to do for you. So the simple answer is then you don't have faith. You just want to, you, what you want to do is God to give you candy all the time and then to make your flesh feel good all the time. And if he were to do that, that's not really an act of faith. You know what real faith is? Real faith, and you can agree with me, real faith is a person doesn't have everything good, but he still trusts God enough to pull him through, and then even if he gets burned alive at the stake and dies as a martyr for Jesus. But that person has everything made and lives like a king. While his Christian brethren are dying and suffering martyrdom, who do you think looks like a person living a life full of faith? It's pretty obvious, right? It's pretty obvious. That's the reason why if you want to have a life full of faith, you have to realize that it will have endurance. It must be endured. There are several other things to notice. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I like to bring up some things regarding how uh, faith has the endurance.
Now remember, Hebrews 11.1, 1, the Bible says, Faith is a substance of things hoped for, right? The evidence of things not seen, correct? That matches perfectly well with uh, Hebrews 11. Moses saw him who was invisible. And by the way, it matches with the hope of Romans 5, okay? So go to Romans chapter 5, verse 4. Romans chapter 5, verse 4. And patience, experience, and experience hope, right? All right, you want to get that kind of faith. Notice, go backwards. You have to have experience. How are you going to gain experience? You're going to have to have patience. And in order to have patience, let's be NIV and drop verse 3. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. See, that means pain. That means suffering. So, what we have to understand is that uh, to develop faith, you have to go through tribulation. You have to go through pain. You have to go through hurt. And then you can develop your faith. If you don't have hard times, and you don't have much faith. That's pretty obvious. Amen. When you had a hard time and God got you out of it, or you matured or learned your lesson, or you changed, didn't your faith increase? But every time you had a kumbaya life, did you really think you had more faith in God, or would you honestly say it was more doubt? See? So that's the reason why this is good stuff, to choose the suffering, because... The reason why is suffering develops your faith. But notice, this is a circular pattern. So I don't want to call this circular reasoning because that just sounds like a weakness in logic. But more so, I want to call it an interchangeable system. An interchangeable system which is so dependent on each other. They are codependent. They are interconnected. It's more, even though it's like this, it also becomes this too. Why? Because you need belief, you need faith to endure the tribulation. But as you have the faith to endure the tribulation, in return, the tribulation gives you more faith. Now, notice this healthy system that the Lord does. It's a very powerful system what the Lord did right here. This is a very powerful system that the Lord did. So what he did was, here you are going by your act of faith, trying to put enough faith into it through the tribulation. And what tribulation does, it strengthens even more your faith. And then now you have enough stronger faith to go through a harder trial, a new stage of trial. And that new stage of trial, in return, strengthens your faith even more. And this much greater, stronger faith is able to endure a much stronger tribulation, and that in return develops it. You see this? It's called growth. So God provided your life in a way where you're going to grow. You forgot what Pastor Reagan said? When you go through uh, tribulation or hardship or suffering, it's either going to be a closer relationship with Jesus Christ, or it's going to cause uh, more of a distance. It's going to cause more death. You remember that one? So that's the reason why this is extremely important because it develops your relationship with Jesus Christ even more so. But how can you have a closer relationship with Jesus Christ when all the time all you're thinking about is your flesh? Come on. Yes. See, you keep feeding your flesh. Jesus is hardly on your mind. You know what you are? You're like Laodicea who are comfortable in pleasure and Jesus Christ is hardly in their minds. You know what the Jesus A worship is? The Jesus that fits their fleshly preferences the way the worship service is designed. Yeah, amen. And that's why you got a bunch of fleshly Americans. They don't come to a Bible-believing church. Why? Because they don't have the programs that they have for their kids, and they don't have the program that's fit for the ladies, and then uh, the building is, is just weird, and it's not fitting their preference level, and then the preacher, he's just too loud, or he's just too quiet, and then blah, 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 blah. Now you got spoiled Christians who have no faith. Hypocrisy. 
And you wonder why Christian faith is falling apart and then a lot of people are becoming unbelievers, atheists, and liberals? Their faith is not strong because they're not going through tribulation and suffering. They went through pleasure and they kept feeding off of pleasure. That's a horrible thing. Let's see right here. There's another thing concerning about suffering and pleasure that was, uh, I want to mention. Go back to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 and then 1 Timothy. There we go. 1 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy, excuse me. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. What you're going to notice right here is that endurance is required on your part where you can be able to conquer the hardship. So, like I told you, this, right? So faith has the endurance. So endurance, what does that mean? That doesn't mean take a break. That doesn't mean, Lord, make things easier. You know what endure means? Endurance means sometimes you have to push beyond your limit. See that? If you don't have that, then that's the reason why you're not growing in faith. So sometimes you need to be pushed beyond your limit. But if you live your everyday life by serving God, attending church, participating in ministry, reading the Bible and praying according to your limit levels, then how are you growing? Even physical health requires a little bit of a push beyond your limit. Even the workplace requires that. Now, it's gotten to a point of unhealthy tension and paranoia. I grant it for that one. But even everybody realized there needs to be that push. There needs to be a healthy level of push, right? So do you have that? You need that little push. That way your, uh, your, your faith can be strengthened. And how you endure, notice in Hebrews chapter 11, how Moses was able to endure is because it says, as seeing him who is invisible. So his eyes of faith was able to see the invisible realm. God's reward. God. For us Christians, the heavenly reward. If we keep seeing that, then we're able to endure, right? So if we saw the reward, if we saw God, if we saw how pleasurable that thing is, then the pleasure of the world just fades away, right? And no matter how much the flesh and suffering tries to hold us back, we're going to push no matter what just to get that reward that we strongly desire and we want. So that's why what helps you endure is to keep your eye on the prize, right? To keep your eye on heaven. And the Bible points out, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse... 3, 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You have to endure. Why? So that you can get your reward at verse 5. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive, what? Lawfully. <coughs> so he's going to get the reward. But notice the context of verse 2. Who are the ones who endure? to get the reward. Verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to what? Faithful, faithful men. That's full of faith. Yeah. Are you faithful? Are you consistent? You don't skip. You don't backslide. You stay consistent. That's a life full of faith that's going to pull you through. And those people, yes, that means they do endure, that means, at verse 3. That means they go through hard times. We can all cry about our hard times, all right? And I do it myself. I'm no better than you. But what we got to do is that we can't let these uh, crying moments be our excuse to hold us back. We got to keep pushing forward. You. If you have to cry pushing yourself forward, go ahead, all right? Just cry and then go forward, you know? I don't care. Just go forward, all right? If you got to complain, if you got to get mad, fine. I could care less, but just get that under the blood after that and just keep going forward, all right? You got to keep pushing forward no matter what, no matter if you're uh, crying or if you're hitting stressful levels, everything's unfair, life is unfair, everything is dying around you. Just keep pushing. As long as you're doing that, then you're okay. As long as you're doing that, then you're okay. 
with this endurance, I like to show a contradiction when we go to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Uh, actually, the contradiction is not until verse 38. So until I get there, then I'll show the contradiction, which is very eye-opening. But uh, anyway, I'll have to end here. It's time. Okay. So I'll go through the rest of the heroes of faith. And then uh, right here, so we'll look at the rest of the heroes of faith here. And there is a contradiction to learn. What I like is verse 38. This is really good. Of whom the world was not worthy. Yeah. Meaning that, notice right here, when we look at verse 37, when they were tortured, see that? Why were they tortured? Because the world was not worthy of them. Wow. Praise God. Now, if you thought that verse 25 was a contradiction, choosing suffering more than pleasure, <laughs> look at that one, verse 37, 38. Yeah. Boy, I can't wait to tell you that next time. All right, so we'll talk about that in our next Hebrew study. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Help us to live our lives full of faith in you and to apply it in our everyday living and glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.